Good afternoon. Um, I'm glad you guys are having a great time. My name is Luis Diape. I'm the director of the Dinosaur Institute and a curator here at the Natural History Museum. Uh, today is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mateo Fabri. Mateo is an evolutionary biologist working on the evolution of dinosaurs and other reptiles with a special focus on the dinosaur bird transition. He uses uh, the fossil record, fossils that are found around the world, as well as embryos of birds and reptiles to do his research and to understand the evolution of the skeleton over millions of years. Matteo hails from Italy. He, however, he obtained a PhD from Yale University, and currently he is a researcher at the Hill Museum in Chicago. He's an expert on spinosaurus, so we're very lucky today to have him here talking about the diving uh, behavior of uh, predatory dinosaurs. I just want to bring up to your attention also that after this presentation, you may want to go to the dinosaur hall, and right next to the Carl Towers, the uh, so like the, the icon of our uh, Dino Fest uh, this year, you will find a very big snout of a Spinosaurus. So don't miss that. Please welcome Matteo Fabri in his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for the introduction and thank you to all the organization for inviting me. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. And uh, so I will just go straight forward with my talk. And uh, in this picture, you can recognize two iconic animals, one are crocodiles and one are birds. And uh, surprisingly, in some ways, uh, these, these two groups are strictly related in terms of evolution meaning that they are basically the closest causes among modern animals. And uh, it's very interesting for us because uh, we have crocodiles on one side, that are the iconic large reptile alive today with scales and teeth. They are semi-aquatic, they have small brains. And on the other hand, we have birds that they have a beak, they have large brains, so they have feathers, colored eggs. So they are very, very weird. And as you can imagine, resolving this evolutionary transition has been uh, pretty difficult uh, for decades. Uh, what is uh, interesting is that, uh, surprisingly, the fossil record uh, has been the key to determining their, uh, their evolutionary relationship. And uh, what we found uh, through fossil sites from China and South America and North America uh, we found a wealth of fossils uh, that were actually demonstrating the transition from reptiles to non-avian dinosaurs towards birds. So now we know that uh, all modern birds are just a particular group of predatory dinosaurs that survived the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. And so you understand why we have to go through field work. So this is the most exciting part for our job. What we do is to go in very remote areas of our planet. In this case, it is a program that I am uh, uh, lucky enough to be part of. It's in the Sahara Desert in North Africa. So what we do is to go in these lands of nothing, where there is no vegetation, no water, as uh, you can see, there isn't much food. <laughs> and uh, what we do is basically to dig for fossils there. And the reason we go in these remote areas is because vegetation is a big problem for us, because we don't have enough rock outcrops from where we can dig dinosaur fossils. So our job is to go to these places without shower, without electricity, internet, without nothing, just a pen, and uh, we start to dig for dinosaurs. And uh, this is basically how it looks like in the field. During the day, you are digging beautiful bones, eroding out from the rock, and then at night, you eat from cans, 
on the sensor. And then uh, after dinner, you just catalog or you try to understand what the new acts are found during the day. And this happens over weeks of work. So it's an incredible effort that uh, every major institution is doing because the reason we do this is simple. We can never know what will come out from fieldwork and from the logs, ancient logs. And uh, the reason for that is that um, when we think about the diversity of today, this is just uh, the last step of millions and millions of years of evolution of life on our planet. And the majority of life evolution is extinct, 99.9%. .9%. And uh, our uh, only opportunity to find out about this kind of events is in the geological record. So, the and uh, many times I get asked, uh, but why should we care? And uh, so the answer is very simple. If we wouldn't go to look for fossils, if we wouldn't go in the geological record, then we would neither know what climate change is or what a mass extinction is. So the reason today we are all ringing the bell about the major global changes that are affecting our environment and our atmosphere and our planet in general is because we know this happened multiple times in the past and it was always ugly. So if we want to avoid it, fossils are the key to predict what will happen in the next decade. So, specifically on what I will speak today to you is uh, the acquisition of aquatic adaptations. So, we are all familiar with whales and penguins and seals and the hippos and crocodiles. So all these animals have something in common together, which is the fact that they are adapted to a life in water. They might still go back to land to deposit, the, to make the eggs and stuff, but they are mainly linked to aquatic environments. And uh, the striking thing about this kind of process is that uh, all these groups started to go in water and developed an aquatic ecology from terrestrial ancestors. And this thing happened at least 32 times through time in uh, all those animals that have at least uh, four limbs that are called tetrapods, and these include the mammals, birds, reptiles, tar like turtles and crocodiles and lizards, but uh, also amphibians. So there has been uh, this striking trend towards water again and again through time. And birds are no exception. There is an entire group of birds called uh, the aquatic birds, uh, that basically evolved uh, multiple uh, different ecologies related to aquatic environments. And uh, they span from waders, like uh, herons. These animals are just fishing from the riverbank. Up to penguins that are truly specialized for flight underwater, even to deep, uh, to deep water columns. And we know in some ways that uh, this kind of ecology is not related only among, is not present only among modern birds, but is also present in some Cretaceous fossil birds that preceded uh, the modern groups, like in this case is Ganthus and Ictionis. We know that birds played with water a long time before modern days. But what about non avian dinosaurs? So, all those dinosaurs that are not related, that are still related to birds, but are not birds. Okay. So, surprisingly, we have, uh, we have seen uh, thousands of new species of dinosaurs through time in the last centuries. And uh, what we observed is that all of them are just screening terrestrial environments exception mainly for birds and then we diversify in ecology but Lunavian ter uh, dinosaurs were mainly restricted to terrestrial environment and uh, the general idea that was pushed in the 80s was that uh, their body is so uh, different
different from any other reptile that it was constrained. In other words, it could not change to evolve flippers and feet. Which is kind of a straw man argument, obviously, because what this basically means is if we don't see it, it couldn't happen, but it's a sneaky way to justify the knowledge that we have. And so at the end of this talk, I hopefully will uh, convince you that uh, this was false. <laughs> and uh, so what we observed through the last decades is that there have been uh, numerous scientists uh, proposed indeed uh, aquatic uh, specializations in some dinosaurs. One is the long neck dinosaurs, the uh, sauropods. These were suggested to be related to water because they are so massive that uh, no one thought that they could walk on them. And uh, another example are uh, duck bill dinosaurs. In this case, uh, you can find uh, Edmontosaurus, in this case, in the lower corner on the left. And uh, these dinosaurs, uh, we have a great bunch of them preserved with skin around the bones. So it's what we call the dinosaur mummies. And uh, what we observe is that they have uh, membranes among the digits in the feet. So they resemble the, the feet uh, for paddling that we see in ducks today. So they were suggested again to have an ecology similar to ducks. And then we have some iridromosaurs, the results caraptor in this case, uh, that was suggested to be linked to water with a duck like uh, ecology based on body proportions. And finally, there, there are lithomimids, which is uh, ostrich mimic dinosaurs that is in this case represented by dummy mammals in the right corner, in the bottom. And the, there are some specimens of these uh, that have a beak, a keratinous beak, like modern birds, and they found uh, some plant vegetation embedded in the beak. So they thought that they were filter feeding in the water like a modern flamingo. But probably the most striking example of a hypothesis of dinosaurs, dinosaurs related to aquatic environments that came with the discovery of this group, that is our main character today, which is the Spinosaurus. And uh, the first Spinosaurus, uh, as we will see later on, were found in North Africa. Uh, but the most famous ones became uh, these two examples, Bionix and Sucumimus. I will tell you later why. But these issue skeletons are among the most complete that we have for this group of dinosaurs. And uh, what is striking about these animals that are globally found, but with only partial uh, fragmentary remains, is that uh, the post cranium, so anything behind the head, is more or less like uh, any other predatory dinosaur. But when we look at the snout, of these animals. This is crocodile mimic, we call it, because it resembles the one of modern crocodilians with conical teeth that is perfect to catch a slippery prey like fish. So we thought that for a long time uh, this was a specialized group of uh, riverbank hunters like uh, modern herons that were just uh, ambushing fish from the riverbank and then uh, eating them. And what supported this idea was the fact that the skeleton of Bionix was found with fish in as gut contents. So we know that this dinosaur before dying actually ate fish. But this kind of narrative uh, changed in 2014 when we uh, published this partial skeleton from North Africa. So, as I told you, we were digging in North Africa, in the Sahara Desert, and this is the main reason. It's a Spinosaurus aegyptiacus, and as you can imagine, there is a reason if it is called the aegyptiacus, because the first skeleton was found in Egypt <coughs> by a German paleontologist called Ernst Strome, and this was published in 1915, so almost one century ago. More than one century ago, and uh, Ernst Romer brought uh, all his fossils from Egypt to Munich in Germany, 
and they, he described this as the largest predatory dinosaur ever evolved on land. And uh, he found the same, he suggested the same thing that uh, because it had uh, crocodile mimic teeth, uh, this dinosaur was eating fish. The point is that uh, during the Second World War, uh, Munich was destroyed during a uh, bombardment. And uh, so the only known skeleton of Spinosaurus was destroyed. And the only thing left of this species was just a description by Armstrong. Many different research teams went back to the Northern Sahara to find another one, but it took almost 100 years to find a new skeleton of this species. And this was done in 2008. I was lucky enough to be involved with this discovery. And uh, what we see is not only the importance of uh, replacing one skeleton and that is important for science, but it's also the fact that uh, this dinosaur is very, very good. And uh, it's weird because contrary to any other carnivorous dinosaur, it has uh, obviously the snout, which is probably mimic, but it also has very short legs which is something typical for animals uh, growing water. And then it has also this long tail with uh, long spines on top that we suggest to be a structure to swim in water. In other words, as uh, you, you might have understood, uh, we thought that okay, this dinosaur was probably spending a lot of time in water, was swimming and catching fish. But of course, this created uh, quite a uh, controversy in our field. <laughs> and uh, not many people were happy with our hypothesis. And uh, many other researchers suggested that maybe the tail was a structure to communicate with other individuals of the same species. And the short legs are not necessarily an indicative of an aquatic lifestyle. And uh, also the skull might be just from fishing for fishing from riverbanks rather than swimming into water. So we got in a moment where uh, different research teams were looking at the same bones and were coming out with opposing hypotheses, mm. which is completely normal because this is science. So the only thing that you can do is to go back and find other ways to demonstrate your point that could help uh, supporting one hypothesis or the other. And uh, indeed, when we look at modern species, such as whales, we see that the body plan of these animals is completely transformed. They have flippers and fins and larger heads. But when we look at other modern animals, such as the hippos, that uh, yes, they spend a lot of time in water, their skeleton is not suggestive at all of an aquatic lifestyle. So considering that even modern animals uh, we know the ecology of might be tricky to suggest for uh, an ecology of the other, how can we hope to be certain about extinct species that they have nothing around today as an analog? There is nothing that looks like a spinosaur today. So what we can do is to use uh, other proxies, in this case uh, bone density, to understand the ecology. And this is because when we look at Poland and terrestrial species, we see that their bones are uh, very lightly built. It means that they have a larger medullary cavity, which is the white part in the middle of the bone. And then they have a thin bone wall, which is represented in black. And this means that uh, they can be light to just fly or stay in terrestrial environments. But when we go to look at uh, animals that uh, spend a lot of time in water, what we see is that the medullary cavity is decreasing or just disappearing, and they have very dense compound walls. This is because they need buoyancy control. If you are uh, dense here, you can sink in water and you have a better maneuverability in the hunting and moving uh, on the, in aquatic environment. So we thought, okay, first we want to test if this is a good proxy in modern species, and if this is the case and correlates with ecology, maybe we can use this to infer ecologies in marine dinosaurs. 
And so what we did was to sample 297 species that represent mammoths, lizards, crocodiles, birds, non avian dinosaurs, mesozoic birds. Uh, so basically a wide range of species. And we focused on two skeletal elements. One is the thigh bone and one is the ribs. This is because we wanted to see if different skeletal elements have contrasting signals. And then what we did was to do thin sections. It means that you cut the bone and you make a very thin slices of the bone. And in this way, you can see all the microstructures and the details of the bone tissue in order to understand if it is actual bone, if you know how dense it is, and so on. And so we calculated the density of these bones across all these species. And this is one fourth of the data set that we used. So you can understand how massive the data set that actually is. And uh, the important thing is that uh, not only we calculated the density, but we also do proxies for the body size of the animal to see if it correlated or not. And uh, this year, uh, the three sampled the Spinosaurus, Sucomanus, Baryonyx, and Spinosaurus. Uh, please remember the names because they will become important later. <laughs> and uh, what is more important is that uh, we try to capture extreme ecological behaviors among uh, all the animals uh, in our sample. And this is because to make uh, something that is normal, like uh, walking on land, everyone is capable. But if I would ask you, can you fly? This is way more complicated. So if you focus on extreme of the ecology, it's also obvious that you can do the average thing in some ways. So we focused on diving underwater and we categorize all the species for unable to do it. They do it only partially, like herons or riverbank hunters, and also the capability of going underwater with full submersion. And the same is for flying, when we did unable, not so good, like chickens and tinamous, and then sustained flight, like we see pigeons, eagles, and all those birds. And now, what we did was to run a series of correlations and what we wanted to see is what is the ecological category or the variable that explains the variability of bone density across macroevolution. And what we see is that size does not affect bone density. And uh, it's, we see that uh, in average, mammals are denser than birds, so there is some uh, evolutionary history playing a role. But in general, there is uh, one specific ecology that correlates uh, with high bone density, and this is the capability of diving uh, underwater, submerging your whole body. And so just to give you an array of how bone density looks like, you see that we have flying and terrestrial animals that have open, larger medullary cavities. And then you have to go to diving animals to have the closure of this uh, character, and they start to be really, really dense. So there is a striking correlation. And just to make a point again, <laughs> What we see is that, uh, indeed, this is what happens. If you go fully submerged underwater, you will have a very dense skeleton. So when we go in non avian dinosaurs, what happens is that this is a general distribution of the bone density across uh, all our species. And what we see is that they are divided by ecology. And uh, as you see, the terrestrial and flying animals have the range of lowest bone densities, but the diving animals have the highest. And uh, surprising or not is the fact that spinosaurs occupy a very special place among the highest bone density. In particular, Spinosaurus and Marionyx have uh, a skeleton density that is more similar to crocodiles and penguins rather than animals of the world of them. This is different for Sucomimus, another Spinosaur that we discussed before, that actually seem to be way more terrestrial. 
And uh, so at this point, uh, we wanted to see how strong uh, our inference actually was. So what we did was to run the analysis 100 times, every time ch changing a value. For example, we changed the, the, the evolutionary relationships between species to see if the history of the group had an impact. We changed the age of the tree, it means uh, origin of species and stuff. So, independently from what we were changing, uh, our results were consistent. Indeed, 100% uh, of the time, a Spinosaurus is seen as a full body immersion animal. While uh, the same is for Bionics, while uh, for Sucrominus, uh, he came out as more terrestrial. The same is recovered by using the ribs, so it doesn't depend on the skeleton. And in other words, it tells us that when we compare Spinosaurus and Bionics with any other dinosaur, doesn't matter which bone of the skeleton we choose, these dinosaurs are indeed dense all over the skeleton. And we can assume that this is indeed an ecological adaptation affecting the entire so, from uh, an evolutionary standpoint, uh, what does it mean? It means that when we look, when we plot the bone density on top of the evolutionary relationships of these dinosaurs, we see that in some ways the ancestral uh, dinosaur was indeed having uh, a terrestrial ecology with uh, hollow bones. And uh, this changed at the origin of spinosaurs uh, where they acquired these dense bones. Therefore, uh, based on this model, uh, Sucomimus uh, is changing the ecology as a reversal from the ancestral spinosaur. And uh, what is even more important uh, uh, is the fact that uh, this change in skeletal uh, density is appearing in concert with the transformation of the skull. So this still supports the fact that this change is related to predation in water rather than being completely decoupled. And so this is the kind of ecology that we think these animals had. So we still don't know exactly how they were moving in water. They were probably very similar to crocodiles in some ways. But what we know is that they were spending a lot of time in water. They were sinking in water and they were catching fish for uh, uh, hunting and feeding. And so in conclusion, what we can say is that uh, our analysis, uh, yes, support the bone density as an indicator of ecology, which is great news because when we go to dig the skeletons in these remote areas, usually you never have a perfect skeleton of a dinosaur. You usually have fragmentary remains. But using this kind of variable can tell us a lot about the ecology because you can apply it and the ecology before knowing the entire anatomy of the dinosaur itself. Another important thing is that, uh, yes, dinosaurs were not, were indeed uh, mainly terrestrial, but in this case uh, we found that one group uh, was indeed specialized uh, in diving behavior uh, in shallow waters in the northern Africa. And uh, in some ways, uh, this increases uh, our understanding of ecological diversity among dinosaurs, indeed uh, expanding it in some ways. And so with this, I want to thank uh, my postdoc advisor, Jimmy O'Connor, who was uh, actually with the student here. <laughs> and then uh, I want to thank all my collaborators for the research that was possible, that was made possible, all the reconstructions, skeletal and uh, more life reconstructions were done by Davide Bonadonna and Marco Auditore. And of course, I want to thank all the funding resources that made this research possible. And with this, I'm uh, happy to take your questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That was a really interesting presentation. Do you think that these diving dinosaurs um, 
survive in any species later on today? Or did they die out? So they all died on. The only group that survived the mass extinction and is still present today are birds. And uh, they were not modern birds at that time were not the only birds around. There were many different groups of birds that were very weird. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but Luis is the main expert in the world for this, so he can tell you more. Uh, but so there were many different groups of birds, and there were many group, different groups of non avian dinosaurs that are still uh, ancestrally, ancestral birds in some ways. Uh, and the only group that uh, survived is what we call today modern birds. So some one peculiar kind of dinosaurs survive today. And uh, we could also argue that today dinosaurs are more common than they were in the Mesozoic. <laughs> uh, because today we have 10,000 species, uh, just today, 10,000 species. And they were uh, all in the range from small bodied to mid bodied animals in terms of body size and this is the classical body size situation where you have major diversification of species there is a reason if in mammals the most species groups are bats and rodents because they are small and they can adapt easily to ecologies rather than large body animals thank you any other question Spinosaurus, we had more than 12 different species of crocodiles, some of which were even larger than Spinosaurus in size. So the reason we know that is because, first of all, the Spinosaurus has some minute details of the teeth. They have a very high vascularity on the surface of the carina, and they have carina, like serrations and stuff. So like, uh, there are some tricks to recognize Spinosaurus versus Crocodile, but I have to admit, sometimes it's quite difficult. And uh, so when that happens, it's better to say Crocodile than Spinosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> you have any other questions? Well, Yes, <laughs> fantastic. Now that's an excellent question because it happens the whole time. So in general we have some dinosaurs uh, we know pretty well. So this one probably is the best uh, one. So there are some dinosaurs that we know pretty well, like uh, Allosaurus. We have more than 70 skeletons. Uh, Triceratops, we have more than 90. Uh, T-Rex, we have more than 30. So we basically know each part of the skeleton just checking uh, the different skeletons and putting them together. So it's still an approximation, but it's a very, very good approximation. It's not perfect, but very good. Uh, there are some other dinosaurs uh, we know from single teeth. In my opinion, those are the dinosaurs that should have never born. <laughs> Meaning that uh, you shouldn't make a new species of dinosaurs from one single tooth. So in that case, uh, it's pure intention and fantasy and people are dreaming. <laughs> but in this case, we are in the middle ground. And so I can tell you that uh, the orange parts in these dinosaurs are what we actually have. So, uh, Suchomarius is the most complete spinosaur that uh, we know of. And it's pretty complete. And if you look at the tail, that is a general tail uh, for a therapod dinosaur, for a predatory dinosaur. So we are just filling the gap. For baryonics, what we have is basically from the pelvis up. And uh, what you see is that uh, it's pretty much 
Brenda Solidano, so for everything that we don't know. This doesn't mean that it's correct. Maybe tomorrow we find the tail and it has a sail in the tail. Or maybe we find that it has a pygostal, which is basically what we see in birds, where all the tail is just fused together in a single ossification. So maybe it didn't have a tail. But the fact that we know where in the evolutionary tree is falling, then it allows us to make a parsimonious guess, meaning that the most probably is more similar to the dinosaur preserving the tail that is next to it in the evolutionary tree. Maybe it's not correct and it was super weird, but we go with the basic assumption. This was exactly what happened with Spinosaurus. So the interesting thing for it is that uh, it's incredibly weird, so you might ask me, why do you know it had a sail on the back? Why does it have the long neck? This is because the Spinosaur that Anne Stromer found in Egypt and described in 1915 was from behind the pelvis up to the snout. So we have a good guess, and this yes had a dorsal sail. And that's one of the main traits uh, shouting this is Spinosaurus. Uh, so we know the upper part. The surprise for us was to get the part that was not known, which were the legs and the tail. And then every reconstruction before our papers were showing Spinosaurus like a bionics or Sucomimus, because they were the cousins of Spinosaurus that we knew more about, so the assumption was uh, probably they are very similar. But then you find the actual bones, <laughs> and it's all wrong. <laughs> so it's a guess, uh, but the only way you have to test if you were right or not is to find the uh, bones. It's the only way to do it. We have time for one more question. Okay. Hi, Just something that I uh, wondered about for a while is considering like the virtually global distribution of spinosaurs, or that have come on almost every single continent, well, that there aren't parts of that, and also North America. So what I'm wondering is, what is the probability that maybe there, that some of the variants of the and uh, spinosaurs may have actually made it into North America during the early Cretaceous and have not come, or if they never made it to North America, what would have been like that, that either biotic or abiotic barrier that kept them out? Yeah, so that's a very good question that uh, there is no answer to it. But I can tell you why maybe there are some variables play a role on that. The fact is that when you go to Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America, we have rocks from these early Cretaceous sediments that do have spinosaurs. Those rocks are not abundant in North America. There are, there are. But they are not so widespread. As uh, on the other hand, uh, for example, the Maastrichtian, like the Hell Creek Formation in USA, is not present in North Africa. So the geological record uh, is not the same everywhere. There are some regions that preserve some time spans, and some other regions of the world where you have others. So the first trick is, do you want to study this group? Probably North America is not the best place to be looking for. <laughs> the other reason is that we don't know why, but the North American fauna from the fossils that we find, even for those ages, is very different from anywhere else. So if we go in North Africa, we find uh, large Cacodontosaurids, which are cousins of Allosaurus, but double the size. We have Abelisaurids, like uh, cousins of the Carnotaurus that uh, you can see in the dinosaur hole. And then we have Spinosaurus. But if you go in North America, what uh, you have is uh, small cellulosaurs, that uh, you have some. You have uh, some uh, small tyrannosaurs that are still uh, underplaying in the ecology. And then uh, you have uh, large cacodontosaurids that are still the apex predator. So we have uh, some similarities, but a lot of different things. And uh, I cannot tell you why, but this is what we know until now.